Our next attribute that we're thinking about in this series is the foreknowledge of God. Now, whatever you think of the word foreknowledge and its meaning, I think we'd be in agreement right from the beginning that uh, whatever it is, you haven't got it and neither do I. Um, we understand that it has something to do with knowing beforehand and something, therefore, about being able to understand the future. And for sure, there are some people who believe they have that capacity, but even those that claim to have those skills, when they understand the future, it's vague and it's intermittent in their understanding and it's usually wrong, and they don't know all things all the time. When you think back yesterday to what Travis was sharing with us about the, um, f the knowledge of God, his omniscience, we were thinking about this idea that here is a God who is all-knowing of all knowledge, that um, you realize this God doesn't have a knowledge that's vague or limited. Uh, he's never needing to be taught. He's the God who knows. Well, today for a moment, we want to look at a specific way of understanding what, what does it mean for God to have foreknowledge as well as all knowledge. Um, because when it comes to foreknowledge, whatever we think that foreknowledge word means that... You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Uh, yep, yeah, okay, so that might be the problem. That, that it, when it comes to foreknowledge, the Bible might mean something more than what we mean. I want you to know that it, it's not a term that turns up in the Old Testament. But it is in the Old Testament where we actually get our understanding of what it does mean to know. And the way that the Old Testament understands that term is important. Uh, often to know, when it's linked to God, is saying uh, more than that just God knows information or that he knows about things or that he knows all things. But it is to say that he has a deep affection for that object that is in view. Um, you can see that many times over. But one place in particular, Exodus chapter 33 and verse 17. The Lord says to Moses, For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. And that knowing by name is speaking more than just he knew to call him Moses. But that he knew him, he was, a, he was connected relationally to him. In Amos, uh, God speaking of the nation of Israel, he says, uh, You only have I known of all the families in the earth. And you just think, hang on. Does that mean that God didn't know that there were other nations out there? That's, that's not what it's saying at all. What, what God is saying is the fact that I know Israel is to say, I chose to set my favor and my affection upon you, the people of God alone. Of, of all the families, I have known you. To know someone is to set a very intimate affection upon them. Um, that's why when you go back to Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1 and you read the phrase that says, Now Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived and bore Cain. You, you do understand that if through knowing a child is conceived, that there's a high level of intimacy that's going on. Uh, it's not just that Adam knew Eve and could pick her out of a crowd. He knew her in the biblical sense. Knowing and foreknowing for God is connected to his loving and his providing for his people. So when you come to the New Testament, this idea of God having foreknowledge pops up a few times. And in each case, it only and it always refers to God foreknowing people or a person. It's not referring to him knowing actions or events, although he does have that knowledge. So you find the references in Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, in Romans 8, 29 and 30, and we'll come and look at that verse in a moment. Also in Romans 11 verse 2, and in 1 Peter 1 and 2. 1 Peter 1 verse 2. And in each of those places, as you look there, you realize there's this deep relational element in this idea of knowing. Now, here's why all this matters. Because the Bible connects God's foreknowledge to God's electing people for salvation. This idea or this doctrine of predestination. And that then raises a question. And it's raised questions for Christians for all time. In what way did God foreknow? Um, and there are generally two options. Option one, did he foreknow how people were going to respond? And on the basis of that response, he then predestined. Uh, that view emphasizes humanity's free will. Option two, did he foreknow those whom he was going to call? He had that relational link, and that there emphasizes God's electing choice. The key passage that explores this issue we find in Romans chapter 8 and verses 29 and 30. Here's the passage. 
For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Now, if option one is how God foreknew, then God, before the creation of the world, um, looked through kind of the, the, the pre-published manuscript that he had. And, and not knowing what was there, he, he read ahead all the way through to the end to see how people would respond and who they were. And on the basis of those choices of who would choose him, he then took that foreknowledge and chose them, predestined them. Now, let me suggest that there are some problems that this way, in this way of defining foreknowledge. Um, the big one is that it means that there was a time when God was uninformed. He needed to catch up, um, catch up on the, our future actions that they might enlighten him. And I, I want to say that undermines his omniscience. But when you consistently apply the way that the Bible uses this idea of knowing as this electing, choosing, loving of people, and you apply that to his foreknowledge, it fits together neatly. See, rather than meaning that God's prior knowledge of a person's decision enabled him to be able to um, make the choice to choose, um, it means that God's electing love is his intentional act, his loving of specific people and setting his affections on them alone, just like he did with Israel. So, if we were to translate this understanding of foreknowledge back into that Romans 8.29 verse, it would read something like this. For those whom God intimately set his affections upon beforehand, he predestined. Now, I get that this raises a bunch of questions. Um, but for now, stop and ask yourself. This God from eternity past who knew you, who knows those he's going to lavish with his love, does, does your understanding of God's foreknowledge his foreloving affection for you, does that enlarge your view of God and enlarge your appreciation of his love for you? Or does your understanding of foreknowledge diminish God, restrict him in some way, that there was some point where he didn't know enough? And keep in mind this. Those same verses in Romans 8, 29 and 30 speak of our God who begins what he, who ends what he begins. He finishes what he starts. It's often referred to as the golden chain, that one action in this verse links into the other one. So, see, look at it again. For those whom God intimately set his affections upon beforehand, he also predestined, and those he predestined he called, and those he called he justified, and those he justified he also glorified. And now none of us are glorified yet, but what he begins he finishes. What a great thing it is, this God with omniscience and with foreknowledge so loved us. Paul, immediately in the very next section, goes on to say these words. What then shall we say in response to all of this? If God is for us, who can be against us? And this is our God. And this is what he's like. And with that thought, let's go with God into this day. For he knows this day before we've even arrived into it. God bless.